So who's gonna tell transgender women? Tell them what, that they're beautiful? Me, I'm gonna tell them that. I love women. Um, also, whilst we're at it, misogyny's kind of been pissing me off lately. Also, I'm six foot four. Also, I love women. We're an interabled couple. Of course people are gonna tell my partner that he has a big heart for being with me. We're an interabled couple. Of course people are gonna stare at us and wonder why my partner uses a wheelchair. We're an interabled couple. People are gonna assume that I'm unable to answer my own questions, so they're going to direct them to my partner instead. We're an interabled couple. Of course people are gonna give looks of amazement when my partner stands up from her wheelchair. <laughs> We're an interabled couple. Of course people are going to remind me how lucky I am to have found somebody to love me. We're an interabled couple. Of course some friends and family are going to remind me that I don't have to stay in this relationship because they're concerned that I have so much more life to live. We're an interabled couple. Of course I have to bring my partner with me for anybody to listen to me. We're an interabled couple. Of course people are going to ask me what's wrong with my partner. We're an interabled couple. Of course people are going to be uncomfortable around us. He got scared, dear. He got scared, dear. Hey, why is he so scared? Okay. Why is he so scared? Baby. new hobby is calling things comprised of only men boy bands and the more men get mad about it the funnier it is starting off strong one direction obvious boy band metallica also a boy band men's team sports boy bands the 1950s supreme court that's a boy band some people might not agree with this one construction sites full of men boy bands Okay, is it okay if I touch you? Yeah. Okay, cool. And what are your pronouns? They, them. She, they. I'm glad we exchanged those. Yes. So I recently went to the dentist, had a brand new hygienist, and right off the hop, she asked me a question that I have never been asked before. Does going to the dentist make you anxious? And let me tell you, it was such a relief to be asked that and not have to raise it myself. Because I had serious reconstructive jaw surgery in my early 20s. It leaves parts of my face insensitive to temperature. Parts of my mouth are just numb without feeling. Other parts, if anything, touches my gums in certain places. It feels like I'm being stabbed in the face with a knife. So when I'm sitting in the dentist's chair, sometimes I will realize that my legs have gotten so tense that they are actually lifting into the air. And I say all this because every stitch I have seen of this hairdresser is poking fun at her because it's her job to touch people's hair. If you're sitting in that chair, aren't you consenting to have your hair touched? I was sitting in the dentist chair, wasn't I consenting to having somebody poking around in my mouth with sharp objects? I suppose in a strictly legalistic sense, that's accurate. But we also live in a community, in a society. We have responsibilities to one another that go beyond what is strictly required. And that conversation between the hairdresser and the client at the beginning of this video, it lasted maybe eight seconds. Conversation between me and the hygienist, I would be surprised if it was even one of our 60 minutes. It requires so little time to make somebody comfortable and it asks so little of us to just be kind. Mushrooms can pierce through solid stone. Mushrooms have been observed growing towards the Chernobyl disaster site. They are eating radiation the way plants eat sunlight. Some fungi are thousands of years old. Before trees knew how to grow, the world had 30 foot tall mushrooms. The fastest accelerating organism on earth is a fungus. The largest living organism on earth is a fungus. Mushrooms invented dirt. Everybody say thank you mushrooms. The only reason that men say women and children first in tragedies, like when a ship sinks, is so that they can hang back and kiss each other. Wake up. Wake up, liberals. There's something really gross about how centrists and conservatives like to do this thing where they act like being lacking in empathy or not caring about something that is important to humanity is like a bold political statement and not just you being a horrible person. When you say things like, fuck the boycott, not even genocide can stop my consumerism, what exactly are you expecting people to say? 
Do you want a cookie for not caring about genocide? Do you expect people to congratulate you on continuing to give money to mega billion dollar corporations? You are not a bold truth teller for being like, actually, I don't care about thousands of people dying. You're just an asshole and a bad person and deeply unethical. And again, it is these pillars of white supremacy that express themselves in our behavior. One of the fundamental pillars of white supremacy is that my right to comfort comes before your right to life. And that is the exact thing that y'all are channeling when you say things like, I don't even care if I'm funding a genocide, I'm going to buy Starbucks. Newsflash, you do actually owe the rest of humanity your empathy and your comfort does not come before anybody else's life. The absolute least you can do is boycott. It's literally a non-action. Just do it. You've seen images like these, you probably know that there's a fight against what is referred to as hostile architecture, defensive architecture, or exclusionary design. These terms all refer to the urban design strategy that purposefully guides or restricts behavior, mostly targeting homeless people. Now let's talk about why this is just ridiculous. My first personal critique is the fact that by using taxpayer dollars to fund the exclusion of homeless people, we are showcasing our inability to creatively use that money to promote designs that can instead work on inclusivity. Like, in short, it's a blatant admission that we are more willing to pay to not see a problem rather than paying to fix the problem. Not to even mention that this type of design completely undermines the concept of public spaces. They're meant to be public, meaning to be inclusive and welcoming, and instead of fostering a sense of community and shared space, we've created an environment that contributes to social division and exclusion. I did some searching on how I could help with this problem and I found an organization called Hostile Design and their goal is to literally call out the harm that this type of urban design has in our community. They allow you to purchase these stickers, they sell these stickers and you can donate to them or you can just pay what you can afford or you can just pay for the printing costs and anytime you see an exclusionary design you put the sticker on it and inform people of the way that it harmfully contributes. It's one thing to know about an issue but another thing to do something about it so I love seeing initiatives like this and truly believe that it's up to us using our platforms to highlight the opportunity opportunities for us to enact change that's going to make the difference. We have ADHD. We will lose something the second we put it down. We have ADHD. But first, let me interrupt my one train of thought to talk about the latest Doctor Who episode I just watched. Okay, so. We have ADHD. What was I supposed to do again? We have ADHD. Have you eaten today? Oh, sh Okay, so we all know that David Tennant is the best doctor. We all know this, but the fact that he comes back again is just kind of mind-boggling and I'm still, don't say anything, no spoilers, I haven't seen it. So basically you just like explain something that a person with ADHD might experience. Does that make sense? Could you say that for me one more time? I, I was thinking about something else. Oh gosh, what other Doctor Who facts do I know? Where did you get a hanger? I found it on the ground. Oh, here's a good one. So you just pretend to walk somewhere and I'm going to follow you and you're going to look into the camera and say what you're planning to say. That's it. Could you say it just one more time? Forget it. We have ADHD, and I'm bored of this premise now. Jeez. There are so many terrible things happening in the world. We gotta act. We gotta throw our hands in the air and tell injustice to stop it. Well, one of many tactics is to divest your money. Three basic places you can start boycotting today are Starbucks, McDonald's, and Domino's. But how will I get my fish sandwiches, though? You can eat something else, make something at home, or support a small business. But how will I get my double blonde shot caramel macchiatos? With, with the cute little swirlies on top. You can drink something else. Make it at home or support a small business. But what about my pizza with the cheese? Oh my god, if you care about the people who are dying and you want to take action with practical effects, you want to be Katniss Everdeen so much, then exercise some discipline. This is one of the easiest things you can do. I... I, I don't want to do that, though. You said we gotta act. That includes you. Yeah, but I meant act. I mean, Clarify you know, your statement. act, admit like, it. I, I don't want to be rude. Just admit it. 
you know, be honest I, with yourself. Okay, I meant act like I care. And there we go. But I know you. Not only did they find 250 bodies in a mass grave behind a Mississippi prison, but in order to give their family members proper burials, the families have to buy the bodies back. Two hundred and fifteen people were buried behind a Jacksonville, Mississippi jail in shallow graves with just a metal rod and a number and their families were never notified. On top of that, some of the families to the people that were buried thought that they were still missing and complaining to police to find their missing loved ones. And now they're being told they have to pay a fee in order to have the bodies removed so they can give proper burials. None of this would have been discovered if it weren't for Dexter Wade going missing in March and his mother reporting it to the police and them telling her that they have no information. But his mother never gave up looking for him and it wasn't until October where she found out that her son was struck by a police officer's car an hour after he left when he was crossing a nearby interstate highway. He had identification on him and police never notified his mother and allowed his body to sit in a county morgue. It turns out her son was one of the bodies that was buried in the grave. Mind you, she had been calling the police department every week asking if they had any information on her son to which they said they had nothing and then in July, because nobody apparently claimed his body, they decided to bury it. When a new investigator was added to the case, that's when she found out what happened to her son and where he was buried. When she was finally able to go to his grave site, she broke down while praying, saying, I'm so sorry this happened to you, but mama didn't know, mama didn't know, and they still made her pay to remove his body. In my opinion, I think the family members of those buried need to get together and file one fat lawsuit against the police department because that is disgusting to say the least. They wanted this war. So war is what we'll give. Of all they took hostage, how many still live? They killed 1,400 and filled us with fright. With bullets by day and mortars by night, our response has been fair. To end the violence, we've killed 20,000 in our self-defense. Yes, we're bombing our schools and leveling houses and killing their journalists, babies, and spouses, but it's all to bring peace, and it's justified. As long as one evil terrorist died, they hide in their crowds and hope that we'll stall some times to kill one, we have to kill all. Their hospitals hid enemies in the tunnel. Just don't mind the patients you'll find in the rubble. They all share the blame. The record will show they voted Hamas in two decades ago. The streets line with bodies are righteous and moral. All of our leaders will tell you it's normal. This land is our land. Our rule is prophetic. You call for ceasefire, you're anti-Semitic. We'll kill all the killers, no matter the cost. No matter the innocent lives that are lost. We'll cut off the power and won't leave an amp. Bomb the escape route and refugee camp. Build our own homes on their side of the gate. Then re-educate them to rid them of hate. Forty women are being raped every hour in the DRC, and this is largely in part to the militant occupation in the mines. Every time that they build a mine, they displace hundreds of people off of their ancestral lands to access the minerals in the soil. They displace these people with violence, unaliving, and R-wording. There is a lot of violence used to get us these modern technologies and these devices that are extremely unsustainable that they push out at astronomical rates, unsustainable rates, and convince us that you always need the next and better thing have been done at the expense of Congolese people for a very long time now. So if you kindly could, you may boycott, you can call your representatives and ask for some type of disciplinary action to be taken against the countries, uh, sorry, the companies that are complicit in this violence. Here's a one minute version of the exchange that I uploaded yesterday. 
Hi, I'm anti-Palestinian because they're anti-LGBT. That's an interesting blanket statement to make about a group of people that are full of diverse beliefs. Also, which includes queer people within it, and who all, regardless of their beliefs right now, are being indiscriminately attacked by a military power beyond human comprehension. Well, that's their fault for electing the gay haters because they hate gay people, I can't support them. Do you as an American citizen support every single politician in our government, including those that are homophobic? Obviously not. Okay, so then would it be okay for another country to consistently and constantly militarily attack us and send bombs to our country because we have some homophobic people in our government and also some citizens who would kill other people for being gay? Well, no, they're not me. Exactly my point with the Palestinians. I'm so glad we agree. Was that so hard? <laughs> I'm a disabled Hollywood actor. Of course I'm a consultant that's not getting paid. I just don't want to get fired if I say no. I'm a disabled Hollywood actor. Of course I don't get to ask for my green Skittles or my special water. I'm just happy to be cast at all. I'm a disabled Hollywood actress. Sometimes I don't want to talk about disability all the time. Damn it, I got a personality too. I want to be a hot ones. You got it, got it, go. I'm a disabled Hollywood actor. If a role calls for a wheelchair, I'm there no matter what. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I'm a disabled Hollywood actor. Of course everyone thinks I'm the girl on the L word. And I'm the girl on sex lives. We don't even look the same. Not even at all. We yeah. don't the same wheelchair. Okay. I don't have a I'm a disabled Hollywood actor. Trailer, for me, accessible, never. I'm just grateful I have something. Fugazi, Fugazi, it's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's a fairy dust. It doesn't exist. It's never landed. It is no matter. It's not on the elemental chart. It, it's not fucking real, <laughs> right? Huh? Many autistic people have what is known as autistic inertia. This has a lot of overlaps with ADHD, and it's characterized by indecisiveness, anxiety, and perfectionism. Autistic inertia can look like difficulty starting, stopping, or changing tasks, challenges with transitioning between tasks or switching your focus, having a really hard time refocusing on a task if you get interrupted, Having difficulty with starting a task, and then if you do start it, then you hyper-focus on it for long periods of time. And often the hyper-focus can be so strong that you can't get up to eat, drink water, or use the bathroom. And feeling like you are unable to start a new task, and you are stuck in your current task. Autistic inertia can be affected if you struggle with planning or you struggle to break down tasks. This has been really helpful for me because instead of using a mode of productivity that goes against my brain, I now just engage in these natural behaviors that I do to work with myself rather than against myself. It obviously has its ups and downs, but after being in burnout, I can't go back to how I was before. You want to see what I'm making? A blanket that's a pile of leaves. I've been working on this for a while. I've just been sewing the leaves. They aren't attached to the blanket yet. And I still have to sew the vines because it's going to be like ivy. I'm also working on making little tiny bugs. I'm going to hide under the leaves. You know those cloth busy books for kids? This is like my adult version of that. I think I'm going to do roly polies, ladybugs, and caterpillars. I know roly polies technically aren't insects, they're isopods, but they're still pretty cool. Do you know they don't have a urinary tract? So to get rid of the excess ammonia, they basically turn it into gas to get rid of it. So to simplify things, you could say they fart their urine, which is fantastic. Ah, uh, my brain has been stuck on that fact for a while now. They also breathe through gills. The inspiration for this blanket is from The Last of Us 2. My roommate was playing it and was like, hey, look, it's your bedroom. And I'm like, ha, it will be. I do have some extra brown cloth that I'm gonna hand stitch to be like the vines. And I might try to find some fuzzy green cloth to be like this part up here. But yeah, I'm quite excited. You know how some people look like their names? That's not a coincidence. A 2017 study showed that people were able to guess that this man's name is Dan at a rate higher than chance. We also know that people tend to make associations between certain names and faces. Like out of this picture, who do you think Tim is and who do you think Bob is? 
If he said Tim is the person on the left, you're in the majority according to a 2007 study. But how does someone, oh fuck. But how does someone like Dan just happen to grow up and look like a Dan? One obvious factor is cultural. Someone who looks Jewish, for example, is more likely to have a Jewish name because they're more likely to actually be Jewish. Another factor, however, is that people may genuinely live up to the expectations surrounding their name in some capacity. As we know, the name Dan comes with some cultural expectations of what a Dan should look like. If Dan doesn't like that, he can always go by Daniel or middle name. But if he does like being a Dan, he might play the part by doing things like growing out Dan-shaped facial hair that fits his identity as a Dan. And this has huge societal implications because studies show that more unique sounding names are associated with greater success in creative professions because people are more likely to think those names are creative. And unfortunately, whiter sounding names are more likely to get callbacks on resumes with the exact same qualifications. When we in the West talk about the lack of adequate sanitary products for menstruating people in Gaza, we often look at it from a, oh, well, you know, we were using fabrics back in like the olden days, so they should be fine mentality. And that doesn't come from a rude or cruel place, but it does come from a place of being ill-informed, both on menstruation in general and on what's actually happening on the ground in Palestine. Because you're right, back in the day before disposable menstrual products, people did use sanitary cloths, about 12 inch pieces of fabric designed to do what we know menstrual products to do today. But they were intentional. People who used them had many of them and then they were able to wash them, usually in soapy and lightly bleached water to keep them clean. And that was their whole purpose, that was it. Plus they had an area to do that in. So the blood and the contaminated water because blood is a biohazard, isn't all over the place, kind of, you know, spreading all of the germs that come with blood and other biohazards. Because they knew, as we know now, if you don't do those things, you could make yourself really sick. Your immune system is generally suppressed when you're on your cycle, so you don't want to introduce any foreign bodies into your body. You run the track of getting a urinary tract infection or a reproductive infection that could make you infertile or otherwise seriously harm you. I mean, it could do a whole host of damage, not properly using and disposing of your menstrual products. And so what's happening in Gaza isn't that they have a whole host of like backup reusable sanitary products that they can just switch to in moments of crisis. They don't have anything. So when they're taking pieces of fabric off of tents that have been outside unwashed because they have no adequate water supply, they can't clean those products before they use them and they can't clean them afterwards either. So what happens is because their healthcare system has also collapsed, they can't get access to the medicine that they might need should they get really, really sick. Their bodies can't fight off infection as well because they are quite literally starving. They have no access to clean water. They're risking their lives with every single cycle. And that is a huge problem that every single feminist group in this world should be taking an issue with because you shouldn't have to risk your life for something you can't even control. Starvation is everywhere in southern Gaza. Hani Mahmoud, who is reporting from Rafa in Gaza, says that southern Gaza is now unlivable. Every day there is a shortage of everything, including food. Signs of starvation are everywhere. There are families that live on one meal a day. Some families do not even have the energy to queue up to get that one meal, so they end up going days without food. On top of that, there is a lack of medical supplies and other essential goods. It is having an impact on the most vulnerable, children. We cannot stress this enough. Children are being targeted both with weapons and with starvation. Heavy artillery continues to target the vicinity of the headquarters of the Palestine Red Crescent Society. This has resulted in shrapnel scattered at Al Amal Hospital in Khan Yunus. The PRCS building and surrounding area has been repeatedly targeted in the last few days, resulting in a number of casualties. Israeli attacks have martyred over 122 Palestinians in the last 24 hours, and they have injured over 250 in the past 24 hours. This brings the total Palestinian death toll since October 7th to 22,722, with 58,166 injured. This does not include those who are still stuck underneath the rubble and missing. The number is projected to be much higher. So far, they know that there is over 7,000 Palestinians that are still missing. A home in Khan Yunus was bombed and resulted in 22 martyrs. The victims included family members of local journalist Muhammad Awad. Women and children were among the victims. A witness to the attack said, we went to the bombed house and found the head fallen on everyone in it, children, women, and others, all of them innocent and most of them displaced. 11-year-old Mahmoud Awad gave his account of the overnight bombing that killed his father and siblings in Khan Yunus. He said, we fled to Khan Yunus because it was a safe place. They still bombed us. They martyred my siblings and father. They killed my younger brother who was in second grade and my eldest brother who was in eighth grade. 
A home in Deir al-Bala in central Gaza was also bombed, resulting in three martyrs and several wounded. The IOF have intensified their operations in Zawaida in central Gaza, moving in with tanks, armored vehicles, and attack drones. The government media office in Gaza says that the Israeli army has exhumed 1,100 graves in Tufa Cemetery east of Gaza and stole 150 bodies. Here are some updates for the resistance groups in Gaza. The Qasem brigades have said that its fighters have eliminated eight IOF soldiers in Bani Suhaela, east of Khan Yunus, during an ambush. The armed wing of Hamas also said that it had detonated an anti-personnel device targeting an Israeli force inside a building in Kuza another town that lies east of Khan Yunus, resulting in the killing and wounding of soldiers. In Buraj refugee camp, the group said that its fighters destroyed two Merkava tanks with al and 105 anti-tank shells. On Friday, fighters from the Qasem brigades clashed with nine Israeli soldiers in Bani Suhaila, the group said, adding that Israeli helicopters attended to transport the dead and wounded. Violent raids were conducted overnight in the occupied West Bank. In Nablus city and Shufat refugee camp, we have a report in regards to the West Bank uh, from the Palestinian Wafa News Agency. They say the illegal Israeli settlements are quickly increasing in numbers in areas around the Jordan Valley. Since October 7th, Israeli settlers, with the help of Israeli forces, have continued to attack Palestinians and steal Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank. They have now set up nine new outposts in the occupied West Bank. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free.